Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Please, welcome, please join me in welcoming our webcast viewers. My name is Fred Mifflin, President of the Canadian Club of Toronto and your host. Viewers, thank you for joining us today. We're proud of our club's track record of providing a forum for leaders from business, politics, and our community to share their viewpoints with us and to challenge our thinking. Today's guest speaker is about to do just that. Before I formally introduce Evan Siddall, let me tell you about our upcoming events. Next Thursday, June 8th, Bill Down, President and CEO of BMO Financial Group, will continue our Global Leaders Series to speak about economic competitiveness. The evening of Thursday, June 15th, we'll host a cocktail reception in partnership with KPMG, featuring Randy Boissonneau, Special Advisor to the Prime Minister on LGBTQ2 issues. And on Monday, June 19th, we'll close our season with CBC's iconic Peter Mansbridge. To order your tickets or to learn more about the club, please visit us at canadianclub.org. You can also join the conversation via Twitter and Instagram by following us at CDNCLUBTO or by using that hashtag. I want to express special thanks to today's event sponsors, Borden Ladner Gervais, represented by Sean Weir, and Scotiabank, represented by James O'Sullivan. Thank you for your generous support. <clears throat> And now our guest speaker. The cost of housing has grabbed headlines for a number of years. Across the country, particularly in Toronto and Vancouver, finding affordable housing has become a challenge for many. For some, the dream of homeownership has become just that, a dream. Enter CMHC. Recently, the federal government has tasked CMHC with leading the development of a national housing strategy. We're excited to learn more from Evan Siddall, who has been president and CEO of CMHC for three and a half years. As CEO, Evan works to help Canadians meet their housing needs. CMHC's mission includes promoting housing access and affordability, as well as financial stability. Whether through mortgage loan insurance, mortgage-backed securities, housing policy and programs, or housing research, the corporation's reach helps us make critical housing decisions. Before joining CMHC, Evan served as special advisor to the Governor of the Bank of Canada and the bank's senior representative in Toronto. While there, he led projects designed to promote liquid and efficient capital markets and the ongoing stability of the Canadian financial system. Before entering public service, Evan held a variety of positions in both investment banking and general management, including at BMO Nesbitt Burns, where we had the pleasure of working together, and, and hopefully, Evan, you will agree that it was a pleasure. Uh, <laughs> Goldman Sachs, Lazard Frere, and Irving Oil Limited. So again, if you have any questions, Please fill out one of the Q&A cards on your tables, and one of our staff will collect them. So with that, Evan, welcome back to the Canadian Club. Our podium is yours. I will. Thanks, Fred. Uh, merci. Um, by the way, Fred was my boss at uh, BMO Nesbitt Burns for a while. If you believe that, then... It's true. It's true. <laughs> and I was, I'm sure, the most unmanageable employee he ever had. And he said, yeah, well, your payoff is you now have to manage 2,000 people, and my job with them is to make them less manageable, as, um, as my colleagues would attest to. It's a pleasure to be here, um, back here. Comme dirigeant d'une société de la Couronne, je crois que maîtriser le français est essentiel pour bien représenter et communiquer avec tous les Canadiens. Pour aujourd'hui, permettez-moi de faire une exception et de maintenir à l'anglais pour mon allocution. Parlant de nos deux langues officielles, that's it. For those of you who don't speak French, I said I'm going to speak English. <laughs> In 1945, Hugh McLennan wrote a great Canadian novel called Two Solitudes about the tension between the English and French in our country. Today, I would argue the two solitudes prevailing across the globe are the gap between the very wealthy 
and the deeply poor, a gap that is widening every day. Inequality threatens the very fabric of Western society, and as Richard Florida wrote, uh, Richard Florida of the Rotman School of Management here in Toronto, noted in his recent book, The New Urban Crisis, unexpected referendum results in the UK and election results in the US, which is code for something more, as you know, are indicative of this growing divide. So after a year of broad, gov uh, broad consultations, the Government of Canada and Minister Jean-Yves Duclos uh, have asked CMHC to lead the development of a national housing strategy, which is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for our country to ensure Canadians have the housing they need and that they can afford. And I'll be so bold as to suggest that this strategy is being created precisely to diminish the inequity that we see growing in our communities daily to close the gap between haves and have-nots, and we contrive to solve this problem so many ignore because we are Canadian. I'd like to advance the idea today that affordable housing is essential to a growing economy and to a healthy society. I'd like to assert that our national housing strategy is inherently, deeply Canadian. We've deliberately invested it with Canadian values like tolerance, diversity, and social inclusion. These qualities are in fact central and not at all frivolous. In short, our plan is not about housing at all. Our objective is not just to build more houses, although that's a big part of what we'll do. In fact, we've been far more ambitious than that. People, rather than buildings, are at the heart of our program. As Harvard sociologist Matthew Desmond writes in his Pulitzer Prize winning book, Evicted, the home is the wellspring of personhood. It is where our identity takes root and blossoms. Buildings are full of people with their own identities and their own stories. Along with our partners at British Columbia Housing, we supported construction of a transitional shelter that recently opened in Coquitlam. One of the residents is a gentleman called Mike, and here's his story. This is 3030 Gordon Avenue in Coquitlam, and this is the first permanent shelter in the Tri-Cities ever. There are 95 people at the shelter right now. Those are 95 individual stories. Mike was one of the first guys that came into our shelter. I remember him being dropped off here the morning that we opened. I was homeless for over 10 years. I'm an alcoholic. I drank all the time. Every day we drank. Uh, you drank to go to sleep. One of the areas that we did stay in was um, the center of the bushes here. Nice quiet place before they built all the new development brings back memories. Wow. We'd be visited by either the coyotes or the bears, and you could hear them. You always keep sleep with one eye open, more or less, or one, one ear uh, listening for different sounds that you're not used to. Anybody at camp? Hello. Hey, how you doing? Hey, how's it going? How you making out? Not bad. Sends a shiver. <laughs> you, you can't find a full-time job or a part-time job if you uh, haven't got a place to go home, to shower, to clean up, you know, to feed yourself properly. Once people get inside, I think they realize that they have some worth and they start to rebuild their sense of self. Taking away some of the stuff that people have to do to survive and then they can focus on what they need to do to thrive. And the conversations start to shift from where's my meal gonna be to maybe I can start volunteering somewhere. Maybe I can learn some skills or help clean up around the community. This is a, a wonderful place to kind of stop, think, reflect, and work back on, on getting on track, getting that you know, positive situation in my life, and giving back to the community. I'm not a junkie, I'm not a thief. Um, I just try to get by every day, and I'm trying to make the best of it to, to get back on my feet again, to get some, some part-time work or full-time work. But a year from now, I don't want to be having to start all over again. I enjoy the place, it's comfortable, but it's not a home, 
It's a house. It's a place to sleep. It's a place to clean. It's not a. It's not a home. And I, I intend on looking for a home, a permanent home. I definitely will not go back outside. I do have two birds that I care about a lot, so there's no way I'm going back outside. So Mike's story is one of 95 at 3030 Gordon Street. We can see all that he has to his name in the room in that video. We built a place for Mike to live, for now. However, in Greater Vancouver, like here in GTA, the cost of housing is just another factor keeping people at the margins of our society. Research suggests that housing values exacerbate the gap between rich and poor. Our own research at CMHC has found a very strong relationship here in Toronto between wealth and income inequality and house prices. Our observation echoes the work, famous work of a guy called Matthew Roginley at MIT, whose work shows that the share of net income generated by housing has risen in all G7 economies since data became available after World War II. He says observers concerned about the distribution of income should keep an eye on housing costs. Housing has helped the rich get richer as the poor get poorer. That's true for Mike, and in fact, it can be true for entire economies as well. I've talked before about the relationship between high house prices, household debt, and the increased potential for economic weakness. An attempt to quantify that drag on an economy has now been made. Economists looked at the experience of 54 economies from 1990 to 2015 and found that for every 1% increase in household debt to GDP tended to lower growth in the long run by one-tenth of 1%. While household debt initially provides a temporary boost for consumption, mostly for less than a year, the negative long-run effects on consumption tend to intensify as household debt to GDP exceeds 60%. And the overall drag on GDP growth tends to intensify when the ratio exceeds 80%. And today, Canada sits well over both thresholds. A YouTube video on wealth inequality in America paints a worrisome picture. Now with almost 20 million views, the video explains that the top 1% own 40% of America's wealth, while the bottom 80% hold only seven. Nelson Mandela said that as long as poverty, injustice, and growth, gross, excuse me, inequality persist in the world, none of us can truly rest. Mandela meant this in sympathetic terms, but there's a menacing side as well. As a matter of fact, the last time this level of inequality existed, Fractures emerged in our society, the world ultimately went to war, and a Great Depression followed. As I mentioned earlier, it turns out that housing has aggravated our inequality problem. Conversely, therefore, affordable housing can offer a solution. Emerging clouds call for governments to act. We must first identify the causes behind housing affordability problems, the problems we're trying to solve. And solutions, policy must be based on evidence and rigor, not anecdotes about who's buying what in what neighborhoods. CMHC has recently conducted extensive economic research on the causes behind price escalation in Canada's two major cities, Vancouver and Toronto. And we weren't surprised that over the long run, the primary causes were core fundamental economics, namely economic growth and job creation, second, population growth and immigration, and by the way, Vancouver and Toronto lead the country on those two measures. And thirdly, of course, low interest rates provide further stimulus. Interestingly, Vancouver and Toronto are increasingly in the company of world-class cities. House prices in major global cities are decoupling from their home countries and behaving more like each other. Cities are truly our economic engines, and urbanization is predicted to continue. Cities now account for 54.5% of the world's population and are projected to be two-thirds by 2050, doubling the urban population from now till then and reflecting a full reversal of the urban-rural proportion in 100 years. House price pressure in Canadian cities will therefore continue to build. Three other factors are meaningful to short-term price appreciation, the price appreciation we feel every day as homeowners or aspiring homeowners, and they are speculation and investment activity, secondly, the wealth and income effect I mentioned earlier, and thirdly, supply. 
As to the first of these, despite hearsay about foreign investment solely driving prices up, all of the data confirmed that the majority of investment activity is still from domestic sources. As the IMF commented just yesterday in its annual review of the Canadian economy, taxes targeting foreign buyers are discriminatory. While foreign investment is increasing, policy must address the impacts of speculation, whatever the source. And in fact, governments cannot fully contain the combined sources of increasing housing demand in Toronto and Vancouver. Policies that further stimulate demand, however, only push prices higher, and that makes the problem worse. Demand-side support seems appealing, but it can be counterproductive. Mortgage insurance and the capital gains exemption on the sale of primary residences both add to primary demand in our country, and in the absence of a response, a supply response, policies like these tend to make sellers wealthier and exacerbate this divisive inequality gap. So affordability challenges therefore call for a supply-based policy response, and that's exactly what we've done. Canada's national housing strategy aims to increase rental supply by up to 80,000 units and to modernize another 250,000 units over 11 years. This strategy will stimulate roughly $9 of supply for every $1 of demand it aids. In addition, our recently launched rental construction financing initiative will give preference to projects in municipalities that accelerate approvals and waive fees. We're incentivizing more and faster supply. Over time, housing, and con housing construction in Canada has diverted away from purpose-built rental housing. Yet core housing need, a measure of housing affordability that asserts that having to spend more than 30% of your pre-tax income to access adequate, suitable local housing is onerous. Among renters, this measure sits at four times higher than for owners at 26.4% compared to six and a half. So our aim with the National Housing Strategy is to address this rental gap. Vacancy rates in Toronto at about 1.3% and Vancouver at seven tenths of 1% manifest the shortage of rental housing for people who need it the most. Our national housing strategy sets out a vision for housing in Canada. It says Canadians should have the housing that meets their needs and that they can afford. Affordable housing is a cornerstone of sustainable, inclusive communities and a Canadian economy where we can prosper and thrive. After extensive consultations last year, we've designed programs together that together are intended to channel multiple efforts into a coherent, integrated, people-based housing strategy. Many of these initiatives were outlined in the recent federal budget, which included a historic commitment of $11.2 billion for federal funding and housing over the next 11 years. Of this amount, $3.2 billion will be cost-matched by provinces and territories to target the different needs we have across the country. And I'd like to just acknowledge the presence of my colleague and friend, Laurie LeBlanc, the Deputy Minister of Housing for the Province of Ontario and one of my partners in this venture. A further $2 billion has been committed to tackle the persistent problem of homelessness to be delivered by our colleagues at Employment and Social Development Canada. The government has also committed $6 billion of funding to be delivered directly by CMHC to target national housing priorities. This includes investments of $300 million in northern housing, $225 million for a new Indigenous off-reserve housing program, $200 million to make federal lands and buildings available for affordable housing, and $241 million to improve housing data and analytics. But the bulk of this funding, a full $5 billion, will be devoted to a new national housing fund, and I'm going to just talk about that briefly. This fund is at the center of the government's leadership role in housing. It takes advantage of our role as the government of Canada as, as, as a convener, a national convener. So we will use it to unify and breathe efforts, breathe energy, excuse me, into the efforts of others. And it's even more powerful than it appears. Our aim is to use this $5 billion national housing fund to stimulate over $16 billion of investments over the next 11 years. Beyond the long-term funding commitment, the National Housing Fund enables us to reimagine how to do housing. Importantly, a significant portion of the fund will be dedicated to a co-investment initiative that will empower CMHC to form housing-related partnerships with municipalities, housing co-ops, non-profit housing providers, and private companies to drive people and place-based housing innovation. And working with provinces and territories, 
we will co-invest with proponents so that housing can complement other socioeconomic priorities, such as health, education, housing for seniors, at-risk youth, women shelters, LGBTQ uh, people, et cetera. We'll be making loans and capital investments to create energy efficient, healthy, affordable housing that's better connected to transit and jobs with integrated services and social supports and that promotes social inclusion and diversity. Renewing existing social housing infrastructure, I say as I look at Lori, will contribute to the economic productivity and social vibrancy of communities, making them places where businesses want to invest and where people want to live, work, and play. The government also committed definitively to sustain several billion dollars of funding to us as long-term social housing agreements expire in the coming years. And we've been asked to consult with our partners and propose ideas on how these funds can be directed to where they're most needed. And finally, where more, while much more work needs to be done, Budget 2017 also included a $4 billion Indigenous infrastructure fund that includes housing as part of its purview. So all in all, combining Budget 2016 and 2017, the government has committed over $30 billion to housing in Canada from 2016-17 to 27-28. And that's on top of the $18 billion that was already committed. I think we can confidently call that a renewed federal leadership role in housing. Minister Duclos will formally not launch the particulars of the strategy later this year once we've fleshed out some program features and implementa implementation details with provinces, territories, Indigenous leaders and other stakeholders. As I've said, we know that Canada's affordability challenge will only get worse without more and faster supply. Urbanization is a global trend and Canada's embrace of immigrants will add to the future need for housing, particularly in our cities. So it's a management truism that you get what you measure, and we're targeting transformational results to anticipate these pressures. We estimate that these historic investments will yield tangible results over 11 years, including up to a 50% reduction in core housing need among renters, which will mean better, more affordable housing for as many as half a million Canadians, Canadian families, more than half a million Canadians, this includes 135,000 of our neediest households who are in severe core housing need, paying more than 50% of their pre-tax income to shelter. The National Housing Strategy also targets a 50% reduction in chronic and episodic homelessness. And the budget 2016 funding committed to date will already help more than 115,000 households. Among these are 93,000 low-income households whose homes are being renovated, including 3,300 First Nation families. And these, benefit, these investments, rather, will benefit us in other ways. Housing added nearly $370 billion to Canada's GDP in 2016, about 18 percent. And the construction sector alone accounts for about 7 percent of total employment in our country. Importantly, a 2012 study by the Mowat Center, also at the U of T, noted that at each dollar increase in residential building construction investment generates an increase in overall GDP of $1.50 as the investment continues to multiply through the economy. And downstream costs to society for healthcare, social services, and the justice system, for example, are also reduced. But the impact goes beyond economics. The Mowat Center study also drew clear linkages between affordable housing and positive socioeconomic outcomes. Building on other research in Canada and abroad, this demonstrates that housing matters. In fact, it matters a great deal. When people have good housing, they tend to have better health, and healthy children and teens living in stable home environments have better educational outcomes. A place to call home and the dignity it confers rests at the centre of Canadian society. Our national housing strategy will help hundreds of thousands of Canadians to feel fulfilled as productive, welcome citizens of this country. Think of Mike's warm bed in Coquitlam and the fact that he didn't have to spend this past winter alone in a lean-to in the forest. And I really do think Canada's uniqueness echoes McLennan's great social secret and rests on our values of tolerance and inclusivity, our tonic for solitude and isolation. People feel safer here in Canada. We can still do better, but the fact that people have far more social inclusivity and mobility in our country compared to the US, for example, is strong evidence that we're getting something right. I'll wrap up with a story. By far the most striking experience I've had as CEO of CMHC was at the Tsartlub First Nation in Brentwood Bay just outside of Victoria, BC. 
I sat across from a dour and imposing member of council who really didn't have much to say. And as he got up to leave, he interjected to tell me a story. This massive man was reduced to tears, as was I, as he thanked me for this home that had been built with CMHC's support. He talked about having family dinners, his daughters being able to study in peace and have people over, their friends over, proudly to their home. He said it was a source of intense pride for him as a father. And that moment between two fathers cemented my own commitment to do better. And with our national housing strategy, we will do better, far better. So let's end there. I quoted Matthew Desmond earlier, his book, Evicted. The best line in that book is the following. He says, without stable housing, everything else falls apart. And the opposite is true. Stable housing leads to all sorts of good things. We have a long way to go, and our work will not be done until all Canadians, most notably those who've been here, those who've been here the longest, have a place they can call home. up here. There was no place to stay, so we stayed with my niece. It was pretty crowded over there. And they were in the process of building these houses. I was living in a real uh, dilapidated housing that was on the reserve here, which is now, uh, uh, it's torn down now. So I uh, sent in a letter to the uh, housing committee and we went through an interview process at the time and we were selected for a house. I'm, I'm very proud of my house. I want to make it, uh, you know, make it my own. The, the house itself, it, it's allowed my children to grow independently. They, they've grown up to uh, acknowledge their own space, call it their own. When they're out, visiting or sleeping over at somebody's house or something like that and they come back, they, they appreciate what they have. I have great pride in Poochting. Uh, the people that we have living on Poochting, our members of Poochting, are a talented group of people and uh, given, if given the opportunity, success is, is not even questionable. So we're finally starting to move forward and uh, positive things will happen and positive things already started happening. Yeah, we love our house. Thank you all very much. I need this microphone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Evan. Now we'll talk uh, about financial stability, probably. Right? Exactly. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> so I've got some great questions here, and I uh, hope I will get to them all. The first two, actually, are very similar. Yeah. Which is, um, so I'm going to put them together. How will the national housing strategy affect the affordability issues in Toronto and Vancouver? And then the second question is, if the real estate challenges in Toronto and, and Vancouver are similar to other world-class cities, are there policy ideas that we can consider from the... Um, experiences of other established world-class cities? Yeah, so we've done a lot of international research on this. I'll say a few things. Um, you know, we don't have a Politburo in Canada, so we don't manage the market. Um, that's not our job, and you don't want it to be our job. So part of this is just the market functioning. The answer for places like Toronto and Vancouver that we've set up are working with people like the province of Ontario, the city of Toronto, and I should acknowledge Councillor Bilal, whoops, who's also chair of the, the Affordable Housing Committee at the city and a partner of, of, of actually Laurie's um, of the province. So, you know, Laurie and I had a conversation two days ago about some particular ideas we have to, to stimulate some immediate supply in the city of Toronto right now. Okay. So this is a question that is near and dear to me as a native Newfoundlander. <laughs> um, yeah. No, you're not supposed I can to tell laugh by, now. I can tell by your accent. Right. Um, isn't part of a national housing strategy getting business to move jobs to lower cost cities so that we're not a country of four cities? So I made, I made reference to um, building houses closer to transit. Uh, obviously, that's a way of dispersing the, the demand across a broader area. So the answer to that question is yes. 
Um, you know, we, again, we don't, pro we don't promulgate social engineering in this country, but we've got mechanisms and incentives to promote that kind of thing through the strategy. And is business partnering with you to do that, or? In, how would that go? Well, that, that they're actually trying to locate non-head office jobs in lower cost jurisdictions or yeah. cities or... Not, again, that's, that starts to feel a bit like social engineering. Okay. But I would say that I referenced the fact that our National Housing Fund will stimulate $16 billion of investment. A substantial amount of that will be private. Okay. Um, would it make sense to eliminate the tax-free treatment for principal residences? That's a question for the Minister of Finance. <laughs> He, he, you're learning very quickly. Uh, <laughs> yeah, three and a half years, I finally figured it out. <laughs> um, you referenced the IMF studies or the disclosures, and, and I guess the IMF continues to redline the risks of Canadian housing. How does this end with a good outcome and not with a crisis? Uh, we're actually, uh, Bob Dugan, our chief economist, is here, and you should hear him on, um, on house prices. So we published something called the Housing Market Assessment. Where's Bob? Four times a year, um, and the last one was in April. And we say that the Toronto market has evidence, high evidence, of problematic conditions. That's not a prediction, but it's a warning. Um, and it's based on statistical modeling, and it suggests that there's uh, some, some things going on that, that aren't promoting price stability. Um, the truth is that when markets adjust, individual markets adjust, they tend to be, real estate tends to be very sticky on the downside. Um, and we may be anecdotally seeing evidence of that right now. There'll be data on Monday, which will, which will be real data, not anecdotes. Uh, but we're predicting nationally. What are we predicting for Toronto, year over year? Yep. Single-digit kind of price growth, which is deflation in real terms. Depending, is that a real number or a nominal number? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, that, that is what we're, that's what we're forecasting, and that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Okay. He knows this, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> you can ask Bob later. Yeah. Um, CMHC has done a commendable job improving disclosure around Canadian housing data, analytics, um, housing heat maps. Yeah. What type of further disclosure does CMHC intend to provide, and are you happy with the level of housing data disclosure? I am uh, not happy with the level of housing data disclosure. We disclose everything we have, and it used to be that we didn't do that. Um, so we disclose a lot of information about our insurance business, our securitization business. We will soon publish quarterly disclosure on, our, on the assisted housing business. We're working with our colleagues in the provinces to gather more data. Um, in addition to the money that I referenced that CMHC is receiving over 11 years, StatsCan is getting $40 million. We are co for housing uh, data. We're working on a joint plan together, so we do what we do well and they do what they do well. There'll be a substantial announcement focused on Toronto and Vancouver and Montreal, Michel, in October of this year from StatsCan that we're working with them on. Um, we need more information just on uninsured house price activity. The total, we don't really know if the market's 1.3, 1.4, 1.5 trillion or more. Um, foreign versus domestic investment, speculation, all those things. So. Th those are the sorts of things we're working on. Okay. So one last question, and again, I apologize if I didn't get to everybody's question. What is the federal government's aspiration for the role of ownership in the national housing strategy? Canada's percentage ownership is relatively high, yeah. in part because people use housing as part of their retirement planning. That is true. What's the aspiration for the future? So we don't have a target for home ownership in the country. Um, high home ownership is actually at the margin within a range quite well correlated with, with more savings, with, with, with better retirement income, with um, better retirement savings, and we're aware of that. We are actually looking at, within CMHC, some of our policies to match them up with what we're doing from an affordable housing point of view in the national housing strategy, and that work will be published later this fall. I will thank you all. This is my second time here. I guess when you come back and you're old like Peter Mansbridge, you get called iconic. I look forward to that day. Thank you.
And I'd now like to invite Jillian Riley, the incoming president, to formally thank Evan. Evan, on behalf of the Canadian Club of Toronto and everyone here, I would really like to thank you for engaging us with your insights and the details of the future national housing strategy. I would just add, I thought it was very powerful uh, how you used visuals and video to show us how a home is a lot more than a home. And I really liked the quote, and I wrote this down, the wellspring of personhood. That really resonated. We also appreciated the analysis of current market conditions and trends and how CMHC has intervened to ensure housing availability and affordability. I think we can all agree that affordable housing is a key element to a vibrant economy and a strong society. That's why the idea of a national housing strategy is welcome news. As you mentioned, it will ensure that more Canadians have access to the dream of home ownership. It's comforting to know that you are leading the development, your background, your experience, and notably your passion for the subject matter bodes well for the process and for all of us in Canada. Evan, we wish you, as well as CMHC, great success in strengthening our housing markets, and we look forward to having you back to our podium. Before we conclude, let me once again thank BLG and Scotiabank for your sponsorship. We would also like to thank MediaEvents.ca, Canada's online event space, and VVC for live streaming today's event. To learn more about the club, please visit us at CanadianClub.org. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again soon.